contribute to strengthening the uh, documentary base for a subsequent history of uh, Barnard. That's, that's one of the purposes here. Um, it also happens, I think, to occur in, when Barnard is in a state of uh, relative institutional self-confidence, uh, well-being. Um, the creditors are not at the door, they're uh, just coming up out of the subway. And, and uh, as opposed to other times in Barnett's history, uh, where I think both Rosalind and I suggested at different times to write a history of Barnett, and were advised by uh, cooler heads that no, this might not be the time to do it. So <laughs> we'll wait for a few outcomes, including whether we make it through the next fiscal year. Uh, but I think things are a little better. Uh, at this moment. And what I'm hoping to do is to uh, make this a collective enterprise. Uh, we get up a website, a blog, whatever it takes to keep in communication um, between <coughs> sessions. And we <coughs> just rather arbitrarily picked four dates in, in the fall that this room was available um, and that uh, it looked as though we could get uh, things going. There have been a couple of proposed topics uh, that we I hope we can not only consider, but do. Um, uh, one relating to uh, the founding of Barnard and Annie Nathan Meyer's so contested role in that founding. Um, mm. Another is that the class of 1971, which would be the class that showed up here in the fall of 1967 and were party to the activities of 1968, <laughs> are all already well along on oh, yeah, doing an oral history. Right. Yeah. and. Um, we ought to be able to uh, effectively help and piggyback on that. Uh, they've had uh, 17 or so uh, oral histories uh, that they've conducted to date um, and put, up, put them in a video, uh, which I think uh, is suggestive of what could be done uh, beyond that. And the principals in that enterprise seem very keen to have some help with us. And any help that uh, we can provide on the basis of students, particularly getting academically interested in this subject is all between. Okay, now, um, we thought for the first uh, uh, topic, uh, in part to draw a crowd, if we could, and that's worked, uh, we would take on a, an issue that involved, that there are a lot of people who have, I guess, Clinton would say, skin in the game. Uh, <laughs> some of us were party to the events of the 70s and early 80s. Uh, some of us, uh, Janet Alberstein, Dorothy Denbury, Rosalind, myself, uh, have written uh, some parts of the story or written about some parts of the story. Uh, a number of you here were administrators during that period. Um, so there, there are a lot of uh, faculty, students, uh, just people interested in Columbia University uh, who uh, might be interested in the question that we have before us, uh, which I take to be how did Barnard not uh, merge with uh, Columbia. A uh, couple of uh, introductory points, and uh, I gave out the, uh, the time, the table of events uh, to help refresh memories. I've done enough oral history interviews where people can be wildly off uh, in their memories of what was going on, although their memories are, as far as historians these days are regarded, equally important as the facts of the matter. <laughs> uh, that's what they took away from the event. So any corrections that you should see, quietly make them and get them to me. Uh, but meanwhile, it may serve as a kind of backup. Um, let's see. Uh, merger. Uh, the term was used in the Columbia Spectator only a half dozen times uh, into the 1950s that I could uh, find now that we can, uh, we can search the uh, Columbia Spectator. Uh, and only once or twice did it even refer to merger of undergraduate activities. It tended to mean something else. Uh, the frequency goes up a little bit in the late 50s, <coughs> half dozen more times, early 60s, 15 or 20 remarks because uh, it's in the air at other institutions. Yale's been talking about doing different things, joining Vassar and so forth. And then 
from 1966 <coughs> to 1982, Spectator has some 339 references to merger. And if I did it merger slash Barnard, it doesn't drop very much. So we're not talking about the merger of TWA and <laughs> <laughs> or the occasional discussion of the, of the uh, merger of general studies uh, in Columbia College, which was also going on at that, that time. So it's a hot topic. Barnard Bulletin, 222 references to merger between 1966 and 82. So again, um, it's, it's on people's minds. Uh, what's available from the two sets of trustees, uh, minutes, um, oral histories, would suggest it's a preoccupation. Um, Rosalind's interviewed a, a couple of the Barnard trustees who were central to it, and I think we come away with, with that kind of notion. Uh, that it occupied faculty, I think there were some faculty here, me among them, uh, would say it was a preoccupation. Uh, it, you know, factored into departmental relations with our counterparts across the street. It was part of everyday conversation. When's Barnard going to fold itself into <coughs> would be a kind of opening line as you walked across uh, Broadway. I think the bulletin and spectator commentary suggests how much it was on the minds of students. Um, where else? Uh, administrators. Uh, again, looking at the record, um, Arguments can be made that both <coughs> Martha Peterson and, and Jacqueline Matfield, two successive presidents, both fail uh, to hold their positions uh, over interpretations of this merger issue. So I, th I think we're not talking about a, a minor event. So with that, um, I asked at the outset uh, to be joined uh, by uh, Dorothy and Rosalind. This was, again, Aaron in my idea. So, in part, Erin and I didn't want to be alone if nobody else showed up. <laughs> uh, but they clearly have uh, skin in the game. Uh, Rosalind's written um, uh, on the subject from uh, an angle talking more broadly of uh, the impact of uh, Columbia on women and women on Columbia. Uh, and Dorothy uh, wrote uh, for her uh, doctoral dissertation at Teachers College uh, an account of what I regard, and I think largely because of your writing, uh, as one of the more constructive responses on the part of Barnard to the merger not happening. Now, once it was taken off the table, something else had to happen, uh, and curricular reform of a fairly basic nature was <coughs> part of it. So at that point, I'm ready to uh, hand over the, the uh, discussion first to our panelists because we we, we put them up on the uh, board. Uh, then we, I mean, we put them up on the uh, invitation. And then we ought to take advantage of the Skyping uh, that's mm -hmm. going on from uh, <laughs> Alice and Joseph uh, and proceed uh, that way. Hi, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, this was totally on uh, staged and unplanned. But do you want to have a couple of remarks to make about um, the larger question that we have, why, if we, why didn't it happen? And then we'll go to Dorothy, and then we can uh, open everything up. Well, you asked me to talk about this problem from the point of view of the trustees and the, mm -hmm. the presidents, and how their positions evolved over time. Uh, and I, I think that it might be useful to think about it as occurring in stages, the, the period from <coughs> Um, 1968, uh, when Martha Peterson uh, comes, uh, to 1973 with the intercorporate agreement of that year, because it, that period is the period in which the, the talk of merger seems to be most enthusiastically embraced across the, uh, the board. This is the time when the civil rights movement is still very much alive in the notion that separate can never be equal uh, uh, influences not only thinking about race but thinking about uh, gender. Mm -hmm. uh, the, an alumni mag the Barnard Magazine in 1967 has a picture of 
we then said freshman students, uh, arriving to a quote co-ed campus. Mm -hmm. So the, the, no, the notion of integration co-education was, um, was not only in the air, but I think more positively thought about then, um, uh, than, than, later, than later on. Then with the intercorporate agreement in 1973, the major change there was, and you'll please correct me, uh, two, twofold. One was substantial financial obligation to pay for cross-registration at uh, Columbia. And secondly, um, assuming that co-education co and integration was going to be taking place, um, the imposition on Barnard faculty of the, the standards for tenure uh, that were imposed on Columbia faculty. Uh, the understanding of Barnard being that the, every, everyone who comes up for tenure would be um, uh, go through an ad hoc in which there would be three Columbia professors and two Barnard professors, no one in the candidate's um, field, and a decision would be made and quality would be maintained. The first person to go up was Catherine Stimson. <laughs> three Columbia professors voted against her. Two Columbia, Barnard professors voted for her. Um, and there was a, a brouhaha um, mm -hmm. a, about that. And Martha Peterson, then uh, the president, uh, appealed to then Columbia President McGill to uh, overturn the ad hoc. This is mm -hmm. this is very rarely done. On the other hand, this was the first time. So, <laughs> and McGill um, McGill agreed. Uh, Stimson got tenure, and McGill is supposed to have said never again, which caused. Uh, for those of you who were there, sure may may well remember uh, fear to the, the junior faculty at Barnard. Would a, would a Barnard faculty member ever get tenure uh, again? That was at the time in which there was a turnover in the board of trustees, uh, and the then um, we say chair chairman of the board mm -hmm. um, yeah. Jones. Uh, oh. They expected to turn this over to one of uh, what he was in support of merger, at least, at least open to it, and was expecting that the next chairman of the board would be one of uh, his friends on the board. But there was a, uh, a battle royal <coughs> on the board that ended with the election instead of Eleanor Elliott uh, to the board of trustees. And Eleanor Elliott was uh, passionately opposed yes. to merger. So the next period uh, from 1973 to 1980 was a period of, of of opposing merger. Now I don't mean to, there was never consensus around any of this, it's just that if you're looking at it from the point of view of Board of Trustees, that the, the Board of Trustees sh shifted um, towards opposing merger but still had members, plenty of members who, mm -hmm. who thought that merger was inevitable. Uh, Eleanor Elliott believed that um, uh, <coughs> Peterson was not sufficiently supportive of Barnard and what made Barnard unique, and that if she continued to be president of Barnard, that merger would happen. And this was someone from the Midwest whose whole life had been spent in coeducational institutions. She really didn't get it. Um, some question about whether it may also have been a matter of style, but the Midwestern style didn't really a sophisticated, yeah. stylish, urban um, exactly. in, in environment. And so, uh, and so uh, Peterson was pushed out, and a search committee settled on Jacqueline Matfield, which everyone I ever <laughs> talked to seems to have, have agreed. The only thing I could ever get all interviewees to agree on. Terrible. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but she was very, very strongly supportive of of Barnard. Um, she, uh, the, the trouble is where if, if Peterson got along with McGill a little bit too well, um, Matt Feld got along with McGill so poorly uh, yes. that he stopped talking to her. And it's hard to negotiate with someone who's not talking uh, to, to you. Uh, and in, in the end, even uh, Eleanor Elliott realized that Matt Feld had to go. I, you have point, pointed out that you really don't succeed as a president if you, if the board of trustees tells you that you must balance the budget and cut faculty by five or ten percent on the one hand, and then you, the president, tell the faculty that you're going to reach 
um, salary equity with Columbia. Oh, yeah. right. mm -hmm. Not going to work. Which is why the faculty liked her. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> but the board didn't, and so she was out in 1980. And then the third period is 1980 to 1983, and the board's not going to make a mistake again of going off and on a search and hiring someone they don't really know that well. So uh, Ellen Futter becomes temporary and then permanent president. 31-year-old pregnant president, uh, major uh, ma major step for Barnard to mm -hmm. take. Last time a dean or president was pregnant, she was um, yeah. <laughs> she was dismissed. Um, right. But, so then there were then there really are two issues for the board board of trustees because the one thing that Mattfield made clear uh, to the board was that it faced something even worse than merger. It faced disaffiliation from Columbia. And if that happened, how is Barnard going to be able to provide the library resources, the faculty resources that Barnard had long depended on? Uh, and so there is this period in three years that, that the trustees press as far as they think they can towards co-education without bringing about merger and come up with a plan whereby uh, Barnard students are going to take um, CC and humanities, CC and 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 humanities um, and, uh, uh, and we teach it. Mm -hmm. And we were going to teach it. Mm -hmm. And Barnard was going to teach it. And it's, it's awfully attractive. A relatively low paid uh, <laughs> uh, fa faculty available to teach all of these courses. There would be um, <laughs> merged housing and, and dining. Uh, and uh, there would be some revision perhaps of the tenure at that, at that point. But when uh, Sovereign took this agreement to the Columbia faculty and Flutter took the agreement to the Barnard faculty, no one was particularly happy with it. Unfortunately, the Columbia faculty was really unhappy with it. Mm -hmm. Hope that's, that can, so this is a separate, separate discussion. Anyway, in, in the end, uh, Michael Sovereign uh, decides that he has no choice, that he has to admit, allow the admission of women to Columbia College. And the Barnard trustees have to make the, the, the best of it. Um, and I th the, the thing that the Barnard trustees did that I think was most important was that they um, they solicited the advice of Skadden Arps, um, um, and as Skadden Arps, uh, the the folk, uh, Joe Flom and others at Skadden Arps knew the trustees at Columbia, uh, and they they basically let the trustees at Columbia know and Michael Sovereign know that if they were not generous to Barnard, that they would be known as the butcher of Broadway. <laughs> uh, and that's, that was, I mean, that's not much to go on when you're in a very, very weak bargaining position. But it was enough so that uh, uh, there, there was at the negotiation table um, uh, concessions, concessions made. For the faculty, the most important concession was the change in the tenure mm -hmm. uh, review so that it would be from that point on to Columbia, to Barnard, and a person outside of Columbia or Barnard in the candidate's field. That was that was very, uh, very important. And Division One Athletics. And Division yes. One Athletics, um, <laughs> which I never really understood why that was so important. But all right, uh, <laughs> I can explain that. Okay. <laughs> what about the open OCR investigation into Columbia at the same time? I know obviously Barnard's in a weakened negotiating position, but what about the fact that Columbia was under review for the hiring, promotion, and tenure of women in general? Did that do you think help Barnard at all, along with you know Scadden going to them, or? Um, well. I, I think I think that Barnard was always regarded as as a source for a lot of females that mm -hmm. would help with um, mm -hmm. and governmental oversight, but the best way to do that would be merger. Uh, so I, the the question the question is how, why offer Barnard anything? Um, and I think it was the fear of being um, being being viewed as a sexist boy. Yeah. I think also the pressure on that front had abated. Uh, by the end of the 70s, mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. um, there was an affirmative action program in place by 1973, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and so, it, and and yet there was continuing there was continuing pressure because, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yes, since 
uh, Columbia had a tenure freeze, it wasn't making a whole lot of progress. <laughs> Most of the seminaries were junior people when they left. Yeah. Uh, so. Okay, uh, Dor uh, we'll, we need to come back to that. Dorothy, um, you were, uh, during some of these events, not only a student, but involved with the trustees as a faculty, as a student rep, uh, and then had administrative responsibilities uh, and through the period, of, well, beyond the period of the decision not to merge. But uh, what thinking on this? <laughs> well, I keep thinking, how did I get stuck at the end of the table with two historians? <laughs> but uh, but I'm going to do my best here. Um, I think, so Bob had asked me if I would talk a little bit about um, curriculum finances and admissions during this period. Uh, and if I do that, I think um, what it does is dramatically illustrate the vulnerability of Barnard and its general weakness in these negotiations in a way I think that those of us who lived on campus as students, as faculty, as administrators, really didn't fully appreciate at the time. Um, so to, uh, to take the personal track first very quickly, um, Bob is correct, and, and I see a note here in Chris's uh, pile of notes. Um, one of the tracks that was explored um, short, as a way of trying to short circuit Columbia's conversations and, and drive toward merger was the formulation in 1970 of a um, committee that um, had Carl Hubdy, who was then a senior faculty member, um, Peter, uh, Pouncey. Peter Pouncey, who was the dean, um, and roughly, I guess, four or five senior people from Columbia and one poor Columbia student from the Columbia side and corresponding people from the Barnard side, which included Chris, I guess, as associate provost, and me as the lone Barnard student. And that committee was very interesting because we met for almost two years in something of a um, agreed upon cone of silence and came up with a bunch of recommendations that actually did move forward the amount of cross-registration on the ground, of, move, of student movement back and, and forth across Broadway in a hope that that would somehow um, uh, ameliorate Columbia's severe need for women of its own. Um, that didn't go very far. Um, at some point in the, in, uh, shortly, not, not very long after leaving Barnard, I returned um, to work in the admissions office. And that actually is, um, where I began to have an inkling into Barnard's um, relative weakness in the equation. Um, and, and by way of example, um, it's only in recent years that even the Harvards, Yales, and Princetons of the world have seen single digit admit rates. But it was a little alarming, uh, even to a entry-level professional, who was in charge of the statistics, by the way, so that's how I knew this, um, to see that in the constellation of the Seven Sisters, Barnard was second from the bottom in its selectivity and its admit rate. We were at that point in the early 70s, um, through the mid-70s, <coughs> admitting approximately two-thirds of our applicant pool. Now, that sounds startling now. You have to remember that the most selective of the lot at the time, though its days were very numbered, was uh, Radcliffe. And that was you know, nowhere near the selectivity that we see today. But it was more than half again as selective as Barnard. Um, and Wellesley and Smith mm -hmm. followed close behind. 
Um, so that was one indicator that things were not really robust on this side of the street. The other thing that was interesting was that um, the, the college made um, some very serious attempts onto Rosemary Park to actually um, strengthen itself um, in terms of curriculum and some of the other things that are important to the health of a liberal arts college. And so uh, one of the things that Rosemary Park did actually in advance of the Columbia riots of 68 and before um, everybody started talking about making the curriculum more immediate, more accessible, and more relevant, was uh, to convene a um, pretty serious curriculum review that was chaired by a government professor by the name of Pearson. Peer 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 Mm -hmm. And that committee uh, came up with the recommendation to implement a four-course system. And in an ironic way, while that was, it, while it was Park's intention to revitalize the liberal arts education at Barnard, that four-course system ultimately became <coughs> another severe um, division between Barnard and Columbia. Mm -hmm. So the four-course system uh, was intended for Barnard students to give each of the courses they were taking much more serious attention. And it mandated a complete overhaul of the requirements because you couldn't, with a grand total of first 32 and then 35 courses, you couldn't satisfy the requirements that the college then had in place. Um, so they came up with a much modified curriculum uh, that replaced a year of mandatory English with a semester, uh, reaffirmed the college's commitment to language and science, but then the rest of it looked a little bit like a menu in a restaurant, and that was um, in a way to, to maintain the commitment to a broad liberal arts education, but to streamline it to go with the four core system, and also to give students some more agency in picking electives, students were to take six one semester courses from across three categories with no more than, one, than two from any one category. <laughs> that <laughs> remained the curriculum in place for almost 20 more years and, and had almost no um, philosophical coherence except to give students breath. So there was like this um, internal stuff going on. But then when people started um, trying to talk, when we started to bring the two undergraduate colleges closer together in curriculum, that four core system bumped up against Columbia's credit system. There was a, a, a lot of resistance to increasing um, cross-listing because the courses were deemed to be equivalent. So that is the curriculum. I talked about admissions. Um, and the college then, much more dramatically than now, was extremely tuition dependent. Um, that meant, and tuitions were much lower, <laughs> um, but operating costs were still pretty high. That meant that um, the college needed to keep enrolling large classes, um, and, and that accounted in part and drove the two-thirds, the 60-something percent, close to 70 smaller though. It was smaller, but the number of applicants weren't, the, the pool wasn't there. So, um, mm -hmm. so it w in order to fill those classes in those years, up to um, all through the 70s, approximately a as much as 20 to 25 percent of each entering class actually came off the wait list. Um, and the college was, as we all know, or maybe not, um, the college was heavily skewed toward the greater metropolitan area with a ridiculously large commuting area so that students from as far away as Stanford, Connecticut, and um, the Nassau County border were, were commuting to Barnard, all to the um, end of maintaining um, robust tuition revenues. 
Um, so the, the barter that was negotiating with Columbia was in fact a very um, mixed bag. It had a truly national population in its residential population, but the residential population was less than 40% of the student body. So, um, I mean, it could have gone the other way very easily. There was not, there was the, it, it, it really it was the <coughs> engine kind of maintaining that it could. Um, one very interesting thing that happened in 1975 was that um, uh, another curriculum committee was convened by Martha Peterson in a kind of last gasp effort to, um, mm -hmm. to regain her standing with the faculty and that um, sort of uh, formed True. the, the uh, starting point for my own dissertation. But that proposal in 1975 <coughs> called for the creation of freshman seminars <coughs> and, and really represented a coherent move forward to the college. But in the absence of strong presidential leadership and in the absence of faculty confidence in the president, it went absolutely that's nowhere. That's but that's would that's not, that's but that's it would not that's be that's interesting that's to that's note that it went nowhere. Mm -hmm. If not for the fact that in 1983, Ellen Futter said, okay, we've got to go it alone now. We have to be a much stronger place. And in order to stand up to Columbia and the admission of women, we have to have a coherent curriculum that says, we do this at Barnard, and it's different from the core, but it's strong and it's special, and it's a real and authentic um, liberal arts undergraduate curriculum. So, Another committee was formed and interestingly came up with a proposal that was virtually identical to the 75 report of the Gustafson Committee and this one went right through and, and the major difference I think was that, that Ellen said from the beginning of the process we're going to have a new curriculum, uh, the faculty are going to shape it and, and, um, and I'm going to implement it for a number of years on 79th Street in what was then the Lucerne, right. right. now a high-end boutique. Right. Right. Yeah. And then but, but if, you, Street, if you talk yeah. Yeah. to students, to, if you talk to the many legions of Barnard babysitters who babysat for me at that time, <laughs> you, you will find that that you know that was the um, they love the source of a period of very large and very disaffected classes or uh, a couple of generations, not generations, well, student generations, a couple of cohorts of classes whose affiliation was actually stronger with Columbia, their sense of affiliation was stronger with Columbia than with Barnard because living on 79th Street, they were certainly not motivated to join Barnard extracurricular activities, but somewhat more interested in joining Columbia extracurricular activities. And some of them actually had the opportunity as commuters to be RAs in Columbia dorms, which they couldn't be in Barnard dorms. Mm -hmm. Didn't we also take space at a college residence hotel on 10th Street? Yes. Yeah. Which, yeah. which oh, looked yes, like one of those uh, flea bag <laughs> hotels at the time from the outside. Phil, dear, we still have 160-something <laughs> students. <laughs> <laughs> We consider it a desirable. <laughs> I it, is a I was desi up it is a desirable part of the Barnard housing <laughs> stock, I, I uh, selected say, primarily by seniors. I will just say that in 2000 to 2001, when I was a senior, everyone that was living at One Tenth Street said, "We'll never have an apartment in New York as nice as this." Well, the Barnard people get must fix it a lot. But, if I may, uh, uh, please let me add, uh, uh, just fill out the bone just a little bit, a couple of points. One, if I remember right, uh, Matt Fell's finance guy, number guy, was Lou Wyman. Yes. And he drew, a, he drew a graph which showed two curves. One was the bonded budget, depending on how many students we have, and the other was what we were actually expending. And at some point, the deficit, when the lines crossed, we went from deficit to meeting our budget and surplus, and they used that to calculate how many extra students we had to have. Right. He was institutional resource. The poor thing shouldn't be blamed for the financial plan. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, was, yeah. he was the numbers guy. He was the numbers years. guy. And of course, this, this, these graphs uh, have been called into question. And, and, but then I think that was the, the, the source of that at that point. 
And, and the other two things I wanted to add in to give an idea of, of the atmosphere in the early 70s, because I came in 74, mm -hmm. and the Obama agreement was 73, was the, the way it affected not just the faculty at Barnard, who were very scared, because so Columbia had a tremendous say in what was happening, but how it affected our Columbia counterparts, where they believed that they now had say and who could be hired at Barnard. I mean, I could say a lot more on this, but a lot of decisions were made through the late 70s, which, which were driven by what Columbia felt it wanted, and Barnard really had to put its foot mm -hmm. down at one point That's to right. negotiate and say, no, in terms of field, right. we can decide. Right. Right. Columbia Department that, that's we when don't we want created the FPP, the F, was then the FPC. Right. In, in reaction to Columbia saying, making decisions based on field, right. which we felt were our decisions. Because yeah. they were saying we don't want right. anyone in this field that is in a good field, right. you know, no right. matter how good they are. And Barnard needed these people. Right. Uh, and the other point was that in the mid 70s, given the situation, the non tenured people, Sue, I can say a lot more on this, but Sue and Sally Chapman, and a couple of us gathered together and formed the non-tenure okay. coordinating Any committee, committee right. which we all gave I don't know, $500 each, which was a lot of money in those days, and we hired Michael Squadron, who mm -hmm. was the father of the squadron who ran and lost for mm -hmm. borough president of Manhattan, who was supposedly close friends with Michael Sovereign to try to sort of get some push from, <laughs> from that end to, to make yeah. the decision more favorable. Well, that was that one point. of the things that worked with Ellen Futter as president, young though she was. She and Michael Sop, she had gone to Columbia Law, and she, at that time Michael Sovereign was there. They worked very well together, mm -hmm. which was unusual because the preceding presidents certainly had not worked mm -hmm. well with Columbia. In fact, it, it, he, McGill so disliked Matt Felt that at my Emily yes. Gregory dinner, when he was scheduled to be one of the attendees with Matt Felt, he refused to come. Uh -huh. And uh, she said, come stand by me, because Matt McGill's supposed to be here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What did I know? 19. <laughs> but the last and my best story is when the agreement came through the, which I remember is the 82 agreement, because that was the date on the piece of paper, which is one of the things when I retired, I shred and I regret I did it, huh. is that at the time of the agreement, uh, President Futter called all the chairs together, I was chair at the time, and in announcing it, she quoted the Rolling Stones. Does anyone know this? Yes. This? yes. And she, she said, you can't always get, to quote the Rolling Stones, she said, you can't always get what you want. But if you try some time, you just might find you get what you need. Ah. Which I, it, it sort of sticks in your mind, because that turned out to be a real yeah. good point. On you know, the one thing I would just add from a completely personal recollection <coughs> is that um, there was a huge open town hall in the Barnard gym that Ellen convened to announce oh, that, do Columbia, I remember that. Yes. that Columbia was going um, to admit women. And for the faculty, it was only faculty and staff. I guess it must have been staff. Yes, it was I, faculty was and staff. And I remember there was a uh, sort of a collective gasp and muttering. But do you remember how she opened it? No, but, but I'm going to complete my thought first, <laughs> and then I'll see if I can remember. The thing that struck me then, and I realize in retrospect, you know, that there was a certain naivete that came with youth. But the thing that struck me was, I kept thinking over and over and over again, well, might makes right, might makes right. They're bigger than we are, and therefore they can do this just because they want to, and they're big and strong, and we're weak. But in point of fact, it's a little like Ellen's lyric. We were lucky. They were big, and they were strong, and they could do what, what they wanted. And it was really a combination of the commitment of the board and her strength and this decision to, all right, we're going to forge ahead, we're going to make the curriculum more attractive, we're going to become national, we're going to build a building even if we don't have anything to build it on but a wing and a prayer. And, and at that moment, we really came an eyelash away from just not being able to pull it off. Yeah. So I just want to um, also recollect the power of the attitude of the whole environment at the time. I mean, this was the rise of the women's movement. There were a lot of external pressures to retain a women's college. There was an attitude of competition between ourselves, Wellesley, Vassar, Smith, I think. Not so much Mount Holyoke. 
and the other women's colleges had folded. Pembroke folded in to Brown, Radcliffe, I don't know if you'd call it folded, but anyhow, they reconstructed their relationship with Harvard. Um, oh, what, Hampshire and what's the one up in upstate New York? Yeah. Or Hamilton? Yeah. Yeah. Didn't go with no, the Kirkland experiment. Oh, in Kirkland. Right. So there, were, there was a lot of external commotion going on in the feelings of um, ourselves as an institution, at least among some faculty, and uh, the relationship with Columbia in that particular, and the birth of um, some commitments to think about a women's center, not what became subsequently the women's center, but you know, a gathering place for women doing work on women. And there was a lot of external um, support or movement for that. So I want to add that to the mix. Other reactions? I just, how did Ellen start that? Yeah, meeting? I guess. <laughs> okay. Ellen came in, I'll never forget this, because I, Bob, I gave you my note, didn't mm -hmm. I? And I, uh, and she came in, she says, I have great news. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. I didn't hear that, that you were cut right, off. Anymore. Right, that's all right. No, I wasn't cut off. Oh. Um, she said, I have great news. I'm sorry. Columbia is admitting women, and I think, I think this is what it was. Columbia is admitting women, and we're joining Division I athletics. <laughs> <laughs> So can I say a word about the Division I athletics, which used to cost Barnard close to $2 million a year, and it's now down to a bargain price of much less. Um, you know, there was, uh, that was such a great example of Ellen's ability to put a positive spin on things. And, and I think, you know, Ellen, oh, Ellen then and now has a strong interest in athletics, played tennis. What that really was all about, and I have studied this in great detail, unfortunately, for 25, almost 30 years, Columbia wasn't stupid. And they, if they were going co-ed, and, and, and they were, and they were good, there was no Title IX yet. If right. they were going to compete with the other schools that had already yes. started yes. admitting women, mm -hmm. they, <laughs> they were up the creek because, you know, one of the great sources a bunch of graduates are all the co-ed boarding schools and the, the women's schools and they had to go out there and they had to have something to offer them and you can't you can't build a women's athletic program overnight so they rather cleverly proposed this uh, intercollegiate athletic consortium the only one in the Ivy League the only one in the NCAA from then till now in order they were being magnanimous, so Barnard women would have the privilege of playing under the Columbia banner. The reality was, it enabled them to, to get off the ground. They were able to, um, in the, and, and in those days, we agreed to pay half, because in all those early years, our women were, in fact, half of all the teams. And they, they recruited a, a couple of transfer athlete, athletes, but the first couple of years, they built the program entirely on the back of Barnard's athletic programs. Um, and, and so what happened, sadly, over time, and this is probably not going to be in the history of the college, but it should be, um, we paid wow. more and more wow. 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 And, had, and had fewer and fewer athletes, you know, until uh, to, the, to the point now that we have, what, a half a dozen, if that, recruited athletes in a good year. And then in walk ons. This, in the current first year class, we have four recruited right. athletes. So I was pretty close. We have right? a total, <laughs> over four years, we have a total of 30 some <laughs> athletes mm -hmm. recruited plus walk on. Right. At our peak, we had, or at our peak in my tenure as registrar, we had 60. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, the recruiting of athletes is done by the coaches. And That's right. Yeah. That's pretty much determined. Some of the, I think they are. They do provide a choice <coughs> to a recruited athlete, but uh, if it's somebody from outside of the zip code uh, would certainly, uh, thinking of athletics and going to play under a Columbia banner, would prefer to go to Columbia in most cases, unless they knew, unless they had some inside information. And, and where we have our strength these days and our numbers are completely in the walk-on sports, such yeah. as um, crew or. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple of real stars in the last few years. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but it was opportunism, folks, and <laughs> that's what it was doing. Other, other reactions? Uh, I just would like please. to say something about the 19, 1970. I have kept for over 50-some years a daily journal with every little detail Ooh, wow. and so on. <laughs> and I found I had, wow. to, I had to remove a lot of junk from my Fibber McGee closet to reach the materials that I was looking for. But I found these things and I spent too much time going through, looking specifically for information about the Barnard-Columbia relationship, but also being caught up for too many hours with all the other minutiae of that period, which I'd forgotten all about. But in 1970, that Columbia Barnard Committee was founded and it met every other week mm. through that year. It was wow. really quite something. And then on Thursday, October the 15th in 1970, there was a meeting of the Joint Committee at Columbia um, in John Jay. It was a long meeting. It started at 8 o'clock in the morning and it went on and on. Um, then in 1971, um, there was a, a seminar on uh, Barnard-Columbia relations with a luncheon for Columbia people and Barnard people, and there was a lot of talk about what to do, the, the merger or the, you know, whatever. And then on May 12th in 71, the Barnard College trustees had hearings, and um, there was a meeting with uh, Carl Houghty and Peter uh, Ponce. 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 Uh, to discuss all of this. It came to nothing, but nevertheless, we did not yield to Columbia's pressures on us at that time. Very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, please. So I'm class of 81. Fine. So my strongest memory, name. excuse me, Nicole, Nicole. Nicole Lowe and Viana. So my strongest memory must have been in fall of 80, mm -hmm. my senior year, um, there was a mass meeting in the gym of students, and Dean <coughs> Anna Collery of Columbia yes. came mm. to explain to us why this plan was the most magnificent thing that had ever happened in our young lives. Mm. And <laughs> basically, the plan to take the plan to take the plan, no, just the plan that right. we would to become follow. Columbia College right. students, mm -hmm. um, and that somehow was going to, you know, well, mm. that was. To him, it was self-evident that that was better and what we would have done had we had the opportunity to apply. And um, my, the, suffice to say that the audience of Barnes students were very negative and very rowdy. And I had a similar kind of memory of thing of, they're just gonna jam this down our throats. Like Columbia can do whatever it want. And you know, there afterwards on campus, everybody was walking mm -hmm. around angry and depressed. And mm -hmm. was there was one mm -hmm. point when uh, Barnard students could uh, register across the street, but the procedure was endless and difficult. Mm -hmm. and it was terrible. Well, I, you know, I actually I took most of the core. Oh, did you? I took most of the core. I didn't take um, contemporary civilization, but I took the rest of the core. Mm -hmm. Um, as sort of a way, I guess, of, I mean, I, I don't remember by where, I had pretty loose requirements in those years. Um, you know, there were major requirements, and I had, I um, tested out of freshman comp, and I, but I took two years of language, and I took a year of biology, but I don't really remember many other, well, there was like six distribution so, yeah, I guess, and, But I guess then the core was acceptable for that because mm -hmm. you can take up yes. to one section of CC and one section of lit hum um, for Yeah, so whatever I did, that, so I did, sciences. so I did, right, so I did that. And that was, I mean, in terms of registration, mm -hmm. you had to go to the Columbia Absolutely. gym and stand online for each section oh, yes, to get yes, your card. Yes. While we, my memory is, filled out like a form the semester before and you know, if you were, uh, there were certain um, major courses, especially in English and, and psychology, where you had to go and sign up on the bulletin board. But besides that, I, mean, I was in economics, and there were—I don't know if there was any courses like that. But so I never had to like stand online and filled it out. And I remember having conversations with—I had certainly plenty of friends who were Columbia students, and they were like, 
I wish I could go to Barnard because <laughs> registration is easier. But they come and talk about standing online at the Bursar for six hours because there was a problem with their bill. And the few times I had to go to the Bursar was, you know, maybe there was one person ahead of me. And so that this idea that this small, easy to man manage college was such a better experience administratively was certainly true. Well, I want to make another point about that. I was the class advisor at the time when I was teaching English, and some of my students and advisees went through this procedure to take courses at Columbia, and they would come back in high dudgeon, and the point was, I aced that test, and the professor was surprised. You know, that sense that you're a woman, you're a Barnard woman, and you were able to do this. They were so angry at being put down as second class intellectuals. <laughs> and Professor Rosenberg was my advisor. <laughs> and I just, uh, and you invented, you invented, Mid Katie, so. Allison, you invented <laughs> Midnight Breakfast. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and she resurrected the alma mater, more importantly. Yes, yes. And your thesis topic? Uh, and I wrote my thesis about the, the beginnings of Barnard's history and why Barnard remained independent when uh, Radcliffe um, did it. Because it was uh, it's, it, the way that it was founded. And what are you doing now? And I'm oh, sorry. And now I'm um, an adjunct instructor at Villanova. I have a PhD in Hebrew Bible and Jewish Studies, and um, I'm teaching in their first year seminar, Great Books course. Oh, so wonderful! And you just published. I'm just. Oh, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> sorry. and um, my first book is uh, coming out in March, and I just saw that it's available for pre-order on Amazon. <laughs> Making I was just going to say, and, and the audience that you have in the background, what are the ages, please? Oh, so we have uh, one member of the class of um, 2036. <laughs> <laughs> Here she is. Uh, <laughs> but, so she is uh, nine and a half weeks old. One member of the class of um, 2034. She's two and a... Uh, Four-year-old is very sad that he can't go to Barnard, but he has Barnard shirts. Okay. Wonderful. All right. And I'm Erin Frederick. Oh, okay, I'm going to mute you again. Sorry. Okay, good idea. <laughs> And no more free advertising. It's a non-profit organization. She, uh, she took the trouble to Skype in from Philadelphia, so I thought we yes. should uh, give her a little commercial. Um, and I'm Erin Frederick. I'm a classmate of Allison's, which is partially why I know her entire bio. Um, and I'm, for another two weeks, or this week and next, I'm the director of Alumni Affairs. Oh, Hi, I'm Celeste Rivera. Um, I'm a manager in Alumni Affairs. I work with our regional clubs and I'm class of 04. I'm Janet Price. I'm uh, class of 71, same as Ellen Fetter. And uh, the other thing to mention is I'm on the board of, of uh, uh, Barnard Voices and we're working with Bob and um, we, we, we just donated a whole bunch of uh, videotapes and transcripts of oral histories of my classmates because we we were at a, a very interesting time at Barnard. We were freshmen in 68. So that has just happened. And you can see the mini documentary uh, on Founders Day when we're showing films. And that'll be one of the films. Um, I'm Howard Denberg. And I wanted to note that there's a glaring omission from the timeline, which is in the July of 1971, when Ellen Flutter introduced Dorothy and I. Enough. That's when she was for a merger. And I'm Rona Wilk, class of 91, and I actually heard that story uh, in the changing room when Dorothy and I were taking tennis together my freshman year, which is when I knew I absolutely loved Barnard because none of my other friends had had any contact with anyone in their administrations anywhere. 
<laughs> um, and I was a, a history and English double major. Um, I have a PhD in American history from NYU and have written a lot actually about Barnard college culture at the turn of the century, mm -hmm. like the early years of, of Barnard, including my senior thesis. So. Uh, Nicole Lowen, 81, uh, is an economics major and math minor. Um, a member of the board of the Alumni Association and the chair of the Leadership Assembly Committee for that one. Hi, I'm Janet Alperstein, class of 1992. Um, I wrote my dissertation at Columbia in sociology and education based on what happened to women's colleges in the 1980s um, and got to interview a number of people in this room. Um, I feel very lucky that for 15 of the last 16 years, I have gotten to still teach on what happened in higher education for women um, in a class for a dozen years at Columbia Teachers College and now at Steinhardt on gender and education in the role of schools. So it's nice to be able to continue doing that. Um, my grandmother was on the board during mm -hmm. some of this Michigan. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, um, I think that, that covers it. I'm Barbara Schmitter. <laughs> and I'm not even going to try to tell you all the ways <laughs> that I have been connected with Barnard, but I first came in 1945, and I was a, a graduate assistant, and, uh, and uh, then I taught for a year, and then I went to California for a decade, and then I came back, and I was here ever since for a very long time, through all of this time. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Ended up as the dean of the college, but uh, was in doing all kinds of stuff. And all of this is so familiar to me that I'm sitting here thinking of things that happened, but it's too much to <laughs> try to say. So here I am still. <laughs> I'm 91. <laughs> wow. Not yet. You have two more days. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said this week. <laughs> Yes, I may, ma may make it. <laughs> so, I'm Connie Brown. I'm a classmate of Janet Price and Ellen Futter, class of 71. Um, started teaching in the English department at Barnard in 74 and was a part-time member of the department. Have been, ever since then, a part-time member of the English department, but my paid job is being the registrar at Barnard. Um, so I was, I was started <coughs> I started in administration in 1986. So I've had lots of, I've worn lots of hats at Barnard. Oh, I'm Chris Royer. Um, I came to Barnard in 1965. Uh, I was a class advisor for all four years. The, the pattern was two years, but the 60s intervened and there was all this upheaval and so Dar I had the second part of the alphabet, fortunately, and Dorothy Ehrman was my <laughs> advisee, and I knew her parents very well, and I proved of Howard. Not <laughs> <laughs> the best it does. <laughs> yes, he did. Yes, he did. Anyway, and I've had a wonderful life at Barnard, and I have tried to keep in touch. It's a little bit difficult these days because there aren't as many events as there used to be that brought everybody together mm -hmm. in the college. Um, but it's still very dear to my heart. And I guess the best, I taught many other places before I came to Barnum. And Barbara, I had an 87th birthday Friday. Oh. Oh. I knew that somebody told me it was your 88th, and I said, that's not so. I know. <laughs> She's gaining on you. <laughs> Let her you admitted, try. You admitted me to Barnard. <laughs> what? You admitted me to Barnard. I did. I did. Mm -hmm. Yes. Admit. I didn't admit you, no. But I admitted um, an awful lot of young people. In fact, on my birthday, I had a call from Israel from one of my students who's lived there 36 years, which was very nice. I still have my letter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Flora Davidson, and I'm Barnard class of 69, uh, and I also uh, have a PhD uh, in political science from Columbia and began teaching um, uh, in what, when I graduated, was the government department, but then became the political science department, 
uh, I began teaching at Barnard in 1973 uh, and um, also served in a number of administrative positions including associate provost um, and um, then went back to the faculty uh, and became <coughs> very involved in uh, urban studies and um, uh, I just retired. Uh, I'm Debbie Braverman. I am a transfer student. Um, I was a transfer student. Barnard class of 84. I still have my admissions on. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and I am so glad to be sitting next to my bio professor. I'm glad I did very well. I ended up majoring in bio. Um, I'm, I got a GED from NYU Law School in 88. And then, as many lawyers, took a circuitous path. Large firm, small um, public interest, um, higher ed, and I'm actually back at Barnard <coughs> working in alumni affairs and development. I've been back here for almost eight years, and I, um, I love it. And I'm now speaking with peers of mine who um, have children applying and coming back to Barnard and Columbia. And I actually have a son who graduated from Columbia and a son who's here now. So. It's, um, it's almost surreal to be walking the same walk they walk. Um, and it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm Phil Amorado. Uh, I'm a botanist, biologist. Uh, I came to Barnard in 74 from uh, a faculty position at Rutgers. And uh, with the idea that I would get tenure and then take over because Don Ritchie was going to retire in five years. Uh, the tenure process in the 70s was horrendous. And that's not my word. That's the word of David Ehrenfeld, who left Barnard the same day I arrived in 74. He left in the morning and I came in the afternoon. I never met him. He went to Rutgers. He's there now. He's a university professor. And we didn't meet that day. We haven't met since. But we've been playing phone tag recently. And he said he found the whole process horrendous, so much so that he decided he wanted to leave. He's an author of many books and a very eminent e uh, ecologist and environmental biologist. Um, uh, I was one of the fortunate ones, even though Columbia had dragged its feet and delayed, and the board had to go and negotiate this business of field and all of that. I did get through the tenure process and immediately became chair in 1980 of the process, and was also elected as a faculty rep to the board. It was on the two years when we were struggling with Columbia to come up with the agreement. And I remember uh, the committee, which was Ebert, who had been the head of the medical school at Harvard, and uh, Helen Pong McIntyre, who was a really dear woman, and a number of other people, and they meet with the uh, board and uh, we would discuss and off they would go. And, uh, as an opera lover, I would picture them be Valkyrie <laughs> <laughs> going off across the street to do the battle. Uh, and I rejoiced at the decision, at the 82 agreement, because it seemed like a much fairer way to get the faculty through. But lived through the period when Bond had really worried, and this is one of the points we hadn't mentioned, that uh, when you would query Barnard uh, first year students, freshmen, we called them then, they would say they came to Barnard because it was part of Columbia, they were going to Columbia. And it was only after they were here that they said they were glad they were at Barnard. And we were worried that we wouldn't get the enrollments, the admissions that we wanted. And that's what the faculty planning committee, which I was on, had to tackle that. We were worried we'd have to shrink. And so limits were placed on the number of tenure positions. It was a very difficult period during the 80s. But it, it was a, um, well, the best thing that happened to Barnard at that time, in my opinion. And the 70s were dreadful, and we did have to escape. We did escape the news, I believe. Uh, I'm Jeff Parrish, and having uh, misspent my own youth in a boys' school, I came to Barnard in uh, 2010, and uh, <laughs> I obtained a tenured position uh, as the guy who carries Rosalind's books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I'm Holden Zimmerman. I uh, interned for Professor McCarthy. I am class of 2017, and oh. I'm a German studies major. He's also a whiz at computers. Yeah, he's <laughs> IT intern. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Sue Reamer Sachs. I came to Barnard in 1971 um, with a joint appointment to run the education program for Barnard, Columbia, General Studies and Engineering, undergraduates, not TC, and uh, in psychology. And um, 
a retired from the young program, I think about six years ago, and have retained um, some courses in psychology, which I like, and have had a good time. And Erin was one of the earlier graduates and a teacher from the Ed program, of whom there are probably thousands in New York City and doing really nice work, many in public schools. Um, but the most important contribution that Barnard did for me was that it admitted my daughter, thank you, Chris Roy, <laughs> that um, Lauren was graduated, I think, in 84 or 85, and um, is a New York City lawyer with human resources. But she is very devoted to Barnard and yes. wishes that all of you would stay around so that her daughter could come. <laughs> doesn't happen that way, I know. I want to say one other thing besides all the other kind of involvement. I'm really proud that Barnard retained its um, independence or its quasi-relationship with Columbia because I think it really, I see among the students who come as first year students, how they grow by their fourth year and how really Barnard delivers something very unique to them. Um, or they get out of it, or we encourage it, or whatever the language might be, because the kids <coughs> who are graduating are like super. And I think you can see that if you work with first year students, and then again know them as fourth year students, it's remarkable. So I'm very proud of Barnard from that. But I wasn't graduate from here. <laughs> Nor was I. There you go. on the table. Uh, I'm Herb Sloan, I'm in the history department, and I didn't come to Barnard until 1986, which makes me almost a baby, except for Rona, uh, in this room as far as Barnard goes. I have to say, listening to the story about Arnold Collery reminds me of an experience I had many, many years ago at the birthday party of one of my cousins who lived around the corner, um, and I got to sit next to Arnold. Arnold Collery at this birthday party. And I have never met anybody who was more offensively unpleasant <laughs> than Arnold Collery was, knowing that I was a faculty member who did not stop him. <laughs> well, that for you, Arnold. <laughs> I want to apologize that I have to go because I am an educator and I'm very grateful to uh, you for starting the. Uh, the, the teachers, they had to go and become a teacher elsewise. Uh, but there may be some summing up and some <coughs> planning for the future. Uh, we've got a couple of more dates, three more dates that uh, uh, we've rented the room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can, we have some proposed topics. Uh, if I can count on uh, a goodly number of you for uh, some of those uh, events, we've had uh, several people say that they're very interested and couldn't make this first one, but we're fully intending to come um, on the later dates, I think November 17th, uh, uh, October 14th, uh, November 18th, and December 10th. Um, we had some topics proposed. We may have some topics come up. Um, I hope to the extent you find corrections or emendations to make on these uh, uh, Timelines, you do so because I'm collecting them like crazy. Um, I have a question. Is, is this time? November 17th. We switched it from Tuesday, November 18th to Monday, <coughs> right. the 17th. Oh, all right, okay. The do you time. want to make a commercial for what you have going on November 18th? Uh, let's see, do I? <laughs> yes, that's that's the Lisa, program that was advertised in the. November 17th is Monday. Yes, um, so November and then, 17th oh. will be in here in this format, but yeah. then the following day, you and Oh, yeah, yeah but it's book. it's on the order of Allison pushing her book. Uh, the history department's having a function uh, to uh, bring back um, graduates to talk about the uh, professional utility of a history major. Hmm. Uh, we've tentatively titled it STEM Schlem. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't, we haven't worked out the right-hand side. <laughs> But Take that, that Phil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, they're, they're so on top that they could probably be just sort of uh, cavalier about it. Um, uh, I am coming away though with a couple of 
sort of tentative conclusions about what went on tonight. And it leads from Roz's uh, remarks about the trustees. Is it not a fair statement to say that of all the interested parties, the only party that can really lay claim to having had an, a decisive role in Barnard not emerging with the trustees. Yes. Uh, I, I, I don't think so. No. Okay. I, I would say that the decisive factor was the Barnard faculty. Factor? And, and I, okay, all right. That we could probably count. Which, which was prior, which the faculty pushed the trustees. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. when, when Jones, no, Francis <coughs> Clinton, um, part of the gang of four in Ellie Elliott's terms, uh, went around and interviewed the faculty. He came away saying that the faculty was in favor of merger. Um, hmm. and told the trustees that in, uh, in 1974. What was, I thought it was before that. Was, was that it? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Because um, it precipitated the trustee uh, turnover with uh, Eleanor coming on as chair. But that's 73. Well, we'll, we'll check this. <laughs> we'll negotiate this. Okay. <laughs> right. I guess, um, well, sorry. I, one of my questions has been like, what the role of the alumni was because I one of the defining moments of my college career was I was working at Reunion, I guess it must have been spring of 1990, and Mills College in California, yes. if anyone right. remembers, right. Right. And, you know, was going to go co ed, right. and there was protests, right. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. and right. the right. alums raised <laughs> $10 million dollars yeah. to keep it from going co ed, and the students were like chaining themselves to the, yeah. right. And we actually we heard that the decision had come out they were not going to go co ed the student workers at Reunion, and we asked if they could make an announcement at the luncheon that this was, you know, that this was not going to happen, that it was going to stay a women's college. And they agreed to, the head of the AABC, you know, went up and said the student workers have some news that they'd like you all to know. And, um, you know, Mills College has decided not to go co-ed, and the roar that erupted in that room was but just <laughs> over. <laughs> that, can I just comment? I, yes. My dissertation at Columbia basically talked about that you needed to have Sorry. at least two of the three decision-making bodies, the Board of Trustees, the faculty, and the senior administrators who were in favor of remaining single-sex provided that you were financially stable. And my, I did um, quantitative data on all the schools from 80 on, but I did a case study at Mills and obviously Barnard mm -hmm. amongst others. And at Mills, it was because the faculty were that decisive factor with the administrators and they overturned what the trustees were planning to do. And I thoroughly agree with Roz that it was the faculty with the board here at Barnard that made the difference. And the particularly the because of, in, in terms of an affiliated women's college within a larger university, this is the one, the one college that had its own faculty. Right. Right. Yes. Right. right. That's right. And the others right. didn't. Didn't. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly right. But the, that was a big difference. So to, yeah. her, to her question, what did the Barnett alumni play a role? I mean, one of the one of the weaknesses that Barnett has had was that we had such a high commuting population right. yeah. that we oh, yeah. did not have a lot of alumni loyalty or alumni contributions or alumni interest. Right. Was there, at the in the seventies and the eighties, was there an alumni association voice for or against? I don't think really. Think Ellie know. represented yeah, a um, category unto herself mm. of a strong woman board member who was an alum. Mm -hmm. The Ellie the, Elliot. The, mm -hmm. the prototype before that had been the fathers, husbands, right. and sons of alums, and, and that really was a, a, um, a moment of saying, wait a minute, the alums, and, but the but alums, but of a certain class, if you will, right. um, were going to take some responsibility, but, but it was only because she had the wherewithal to be a trustee. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there was a general, and I was there for some of it. Remember lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there was some automatic discounting of alumna uh, sentiment, right? Because right. it was always going to be over the yeah. shoulder retrospective that mm -hmm. it's not going to be our school again, mm -hmm. and that the situation then was to test the salience of it, 
how intense is it? A, is it a deal breaker of the Mills College sort, possibly, or is it not? And I think the judgment was that it was that it was not. Mm -hmm. uh, that there were there were enough Barnard graduates who have enough times in their careers when they got more than 50 miles away from Morningside Heights, they would say, "I go to Barnard, you know, Columbia, it's Barnard." And, and you would yeah, blend it yeah. together in such a sense that right. you wouldn't be doing it otherwise. Um, no, but I think it was also a factor. This alumni body, like the student body at this college, was always somewhat different from the women who went to the other oh, right. women's yeah. colleges. Yeah. Yeah. No, you yeah. had first-generation <coughs> college students, right. right. immigrants, right. Right. and right. you had all these commuters. Right. So right. it's only the alumni groups, like the Radcliffe alumni, who poured buckets of money into their schools who then had a voice. So you, you ended up, in, in the case of Radcliffe, with this peculiarity <laughs> of no faculty, right. Right. the college going away, no students, right. but an endowment right. Right. that right. somehow had to be parsed right. out. Right. And, and that, in a sense, yeah. 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 should have given it to us is what they should have done. But that, in a sense, is why our alums didn't yeah. have voice. And virtually put some numbers on they looked at all the Ivies and they said, this is what a classroom looks like at Princeton, and this is what a classroom looks at Yale. So a classroom at Columbia has got to look like those. And that meant something on the order of 40% of every class would have to be made up of women. And if it's virtual but not real, it's Barnard women. And if the 40% 40, 40 of them are taking their classes there, uh, the faculty back at Barnard is left, uh, you know, shining shoes and scratching. Mm -hmm. they're, they're but the, as I recall, the issue was a little, it was even more nuanced. Um, there was co-education, so to speak, in the junior and senior year. The issue was that there was no co-education in the first and second year at Columbia because of the core curriculum. Mm -hmm. Oh, but, the, but we do have an instance of where yeah, yeah, but not many. I was no, in all those people. classes. Yeah. I was made. It wasn't forty percent. One or yeah. two yeah. barnered yeah. women. Yeah. In right, that. right. Yeah. So for them that was different. But I had the impression, for me, that it was actually my chance to take Columbia courses was in my first years because in my junior and senior year I had to take um, essentially all my major courses mm -hmm. um, at yeah. Barnard. Mm -hmm. So that there wasn't really, and so that you know, when things started getting tight and trying to put the pieces together of all the requirements for that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, I was doing a math minor, which you know, since there's only one department, <laughs> that was Columbia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, I, I take back my point. I think, <laughs> um, and it may. I don't, be I don't mean that the trustees weren't, but that the that it's very important to. Um, Emphasize the importance of the faculty. No, the presence of the faculty. The, the, the they presence the, pushing the board. Uh, but there were two. They are they uh, two okay. Managers. I'll come back a little bit. Um, <laughs> there were two. There were two portions of faculty. Uh, a majority clearly uh, suspicious and resistant to merger. Right. Uh, an overwhelming majority of the women faculty. A, a tremendous majority of women faculty who knew something about Columbia. That is the <laughs> <laughs> and have been PhD students. Yeah. Yeah. Know right. the that, enemy. That that, right. that that was for sure. But then there was, I, my guess, and I thought I numbered among them for a while, you know, before I saw the light, before my <laughs> daughter came to Barnard, uh, <laughs> that uh, merging wasn't such a bad idea. Um, from a faculty perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, some departments had hostile relations one with another, and that would cause everyone to see. But some departments. Like it varied from departments. Yeah, I said departments. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. was, uh, the Whether they were teaching graduate and courses. They were, already, yeah. they were already incorporated into the, the situation. Faculty. Mm -hmm. The only way to really get salary parity was to do it that way. And Jackie had certainly tried hard to do it without doing it that way, but it was, and that was part of her difficulty with, it, with the trustees. I, I interviewed two of Jackie, I haven't yet had the courage to track Jackie down, who is now in, in Chicago, oh, in, her, in her 90s and still working. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, but I talked to two of her staffers. And one of them was Joanne Blauer, who was at, you uh, and, and then I went off, went off to uh, the medical school as a, an administrative lawyer. And we were halfway into the conversation. 
And she said, well, what did you think about Jackie? And I said, well, you know, uh, she didn't like, we got off on the wrong foot, she didn't care for me, and I was introduced to her as one of the people who was teaching a good deal at Columbia. I could just see her so, <laughs> do, do, do the cross on the situation. And, she, and Joanne said, yeah, I thought you were. Oh. So they were must have been keeping track. <laughs> She's got like a each little day, book. Each day, <laughs> each day they were counting the house. Uh, but there's no question the, ma the majority of the faculty were resistant to the notion. And they were, they were real problems. Of, I mean, the, the reason the tenure thing got difficult was that Columbia assumed merger of the faculty, right. irrespective of a full merger, right. that we're going to do our Harvard Radcliffe thing for, right, right, for right, the next. Right, right, and right. that meant they had to be in, just as you were saying. They had to be in on the initial appointments, right. because eventually the appointments that Barnard made were going to be Columbia appointments. Exactly. And during that transition period, they're continually pushing. And that's why they went overboard, I think, mm -hmm. with the tenure decisions. You mentioned Catherine Simpson as the first person up under the new ad hoc. Ros right, right behind her were Jonathan Cole and me. Oh, right. oh. Oh. I think we get in under the cover of the hoopla that, uh, that <laughs> Catherine had. Cole was obviously was, a mistake. But it was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the rest thank is, you. Thank the rest you. is history. Uh, yeah. Oh, the rest <laughs> is history. That. That'll be the title of our next uh, yeah, yeah, meeting. Yeah, 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 um, that's good. Thank you for coming. And we've got food. <laughs> Allison, <laughs> next time, for real. This is great. Bob, since most of us, or many of us, are faculty people, we're siding with the faculty, or our recollections are, and our memories are. But I wonder if we could interview, or you all, might want to interview some of the trustees who were part of that committee then. If they're, if they're still some alive. Some of them are still around. No, but we have, what Rosalind has have two, done two good trustee interviews that I know of. The Helene Cat. I don't know. Yeah. And That's the what I was thinking of. Well, Ellie's gone. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 oh, oh, you did it before. Oh, you did it before. I don't know. I was just thinking that would be one way to yeah, get their input. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Martha Peterson uh, uh, left some interview material, so that's available. Um, that there was a remark made earlier about Jackie Madfeld that everyone said, that everyone agreed it had been a, a terrible appointment. I'm not sure that's absolutely true, no, but it, but but even truer than that was when she showed up, everybody thought it was a terrific appointment. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Everyone that's thought right. Of, this is a brown that's provost. Right. Mm -hmm. We were scratching mm -hmm. around thinking mm -hmm. we just terminated a president under uncertain circumstances. We were, we were poor, mm -hmm. or we were, had the kind of numbers you wanted, and here's a, a real live person right. showing right. up right. Uh, with right. considerable right. presence. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it went so I just remembered, I don't know why this came into my head, um, through my later dealings with oh, Elaine Kaplan, she made it very clear that the trustees did all they could to protect the Barnard faculty from knowing how bad the finances were. That they, they, really, they really tried to keep it a secret. Yeah, where, where we as a faculty were pushing for faculty salary, uh, parity, and Jackie was on board and right, it, right. she was pushing the trustees when the trustees had a sense uh, that they couldn't pay the present bills in the right. right. mm -hmm. bills. Right. And that was part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, the year that uh, Jackie Matfeld was uh, terminated, uh, she had just put through incredible raises, uh, incredible right. in the sense of much more than we had ever seen. Oh, yes. And so the faculty really was totally delighted with her at that point. Oh, Gave yes. her a big silver bowl engraved uh, as her farewell. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the faculty organized its own for her. Because yeah. the faculty was furious when she a got majority fired. majority of the faculty yeah. across the board. Wow. I mean, no, I'm, I'm just responsible for the trustees. Yeah. 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 I'm just responsible for the trustees. The trustees I interviewed said, we thought she was great when we hired her. That's right. the worst thing we ever did. Actually, Dorothy Weinberg had a luncheon that included Ellie Elliott just a little before Ellie died in a car crash. And she, we got on to talking about Matt Felt, and Ellie filled in with a story. 
and I'll gladly fill you in on that setup though, because we're running late. Because you, you probably know. Do you know who else that you haven't interviewed yet? Dale Horowitz. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. He's got lots of stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I do remember when I first came, I was involved with uh, one committee where there were trustees. There was a general complaint that the trustee board had changed. I'm talking about that big change. Where all the big money men were gone. The Moss Dellers, the Hogays, mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. And that what we had now were people who loved to work for one, loved bonded, but were not big financial things. Sure. So people like Bill Goldman because made a big difference. And there right. were other people, like or, or Dale Harlow. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, it made a big difference because they had the money. Right. But that, I think you're right on the wall when you talk about how that, that change in the trustees you know, we used yeah, I'm doing. Oh, I thought you were doing Oh, no, I was just waiting for Oh, okay. Time. No, I had a, th a thought that I would share privately. Right. All right. Um, Thank you very much.